All right. Thank you very much for sticking through to the second half. I think this is very, very important, my friends, because once again, uh, despite the directions that we've gone and some of the things we've ended up discussing, what I want this evening to demonstrate is that we must be able to, with respect and love for one another, look into each other's scriptures. I will admit the vast majority of my fellow believers in Christ do not know the Quran. And I've told people, the Quran directly addresses you. The al, -al kitab are addressed in the scripture. The al, -al Injil, the people of the gospel, are, are addressed in the Quran. Don't you think it's important for us to know what this book of a major world religion says to us directly. I think that is important. And so I want us to have the opportunity this evening to demonstrate that we can look at each other's scriptures in a meaningful fashion and in a respectful way without fighting. We'll have to argue, but arguing and fighting are not the same thing. All right? So with that in mind, in Surah 4, Verses 171 and following, and I am, I am using the majestic Quran translation. It's the translation I used for my book, What Every Christian Needs to Know About the Quran. Uh, and by the way, I would like to give an invitation to those of you who are listening. If you ever get an opportunity to read my book, I would love Muslims to read that book. Because when you do, I think you will have to be convinced that I tried as best I can to accurately represent what you believe. You may disagree with what I say but I seek to accurately represent it. And I just simply ask that you do the same in return. In Surah 4, 171-172, we read, O people of the book, commit no excess in your religion, nor say anything but the truth about Allah. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, and his word which he conveyed to Mary, and a spirit from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers, and say not three. Cease, it is better for you, Allah is only one God. Far is it removed from his transcendence that he should have a son when he is all that the heavens and all the earth contain, when his is all the heavens and all the earth that the earth contain. And Allah is sufficient as their custodian. The Messiah will never be too proud to be a slave to Allah, nor will the nearest angels. Those who are too proud to worship him are arrogant. All such will he assemble to them. Here we have, I think, one of the key texts in the Quran addressed to the people of the book. And specifically, this would be, obviously, as you know, sometimes people, the book refers to Jews as well. But this specifically is in regards to the Christians. And we are told, the description is given more than once in the Quran, that we have engaged in excess, that we have gone beyond the bounds. The, the assumption is that, well, Jesus taught what the Quran says he taught, and he didn't teach all those other things. That's the modern interpretation. And that you are to commit no excess, and you're to say nothing but what is truthful about Allah. Now, we'd all agree that that is something that is incumbent upon every single human being. We should all only seek to say what is true about God. As I said, al-haq is a vital concept, and I'm glad that you stayed here this evening to talk about that very thing, the truth. But then we have the assertion that the Messiah... Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah. And my understanding is that the, the language there indicates a real, a real limitation. Only, that's reflected in this translation here, only a messenger of Allah. And his word which he conveyed to Mary, which is interpreted today as, as being that, that command, uh, that, 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 that be, and he was. So believe in Allah and his messengers and say not three. Now, we're going to look at each place in the Quran where the word three appears. Unfortunately, Yusuf Ali, even, uh, even Assad's translation, renders this term as trinity. Well, I have no doubt that that is what is being addressed. But the question is this, is it being addressed accurately? Now, immediately we run into the problem with your view of the Quran, because when we look at the New Testament, we will ask questions such as uh, what was Paul's understanding of certain things when he's writing the book of Romans or writing to the Corinthians or what did Mark understand when he wrote this section. We look at that type of thing. We look at the background of the text of our scripture because our understanding of inspiration is not something like a, a, an angel bringing down a heavenly book and dictating it to someone. We believe that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, that he used their personalities, their words, to express his truth, that God is big enough to do that without turning us into a dictation machine or an MP3 recorder. 
that's a different viewpoint where, than saying that all the Quran comes down on Laylat al-Qadr and we can't ask questions like, well, did Muhammad grow in his understanding of what Christians believe or anything else? And so the problem is, what does three mean in the Quran? I would like to suggest something to you. Look up, we're going to look at them, but look up every single time that the word three appears in the Quran. What is the very next phrase every time it appears? I'm sorry, three when it's being referred to the people of the book and it's talking about Jesus, something like that. Not when it's talking about three days or something like that. But every single time when three, when we're told, say not three, what does it mean? What's the very next phrase? The very next phrase always is, Allah is only God. There is only one Allah. Now, if I say to you, do not say three, there is only one. If I say, do not say that there are three rugby teams in the world, there is only one, and we proved it on Sunday. Right? Now, you know what I'm talking about. I don't have to repeat rugby teams each time. You know that if I say there's not three, there's only one rugby team, and we proved it on Sunday with a last-minute uh, uh, conversion there. You know what I'm talking about. In the same way, when the Quran says, say not three, well, Yusuf has already stood up here. He's accused me of being a polytheist. Despite how many times I've defended monotheism down through the years, he's forced to do so because it's what the Quran teaches. And it teaches it by saying, do not say three, there's only one. Three what? Gods. Three gods. Now, in 632, could anyone know what the doctrine of the Trinity was? Oh, yeah. All, even if you look at, at church history and the Trinitarian controversies and the Council of Nicaea and, and uh, Nestorianism and all the rest of that stuff, by 632, there was no question about what the doctrine of the Trinity was. In fact, I would argue there wasn't any question about it long before that, but we won't get into that this evening. And so, even if Muhammad did not know what the Trinity was, Allah did. And so there would be absolutely no basis whatsoever for a misrepresentation of what the people of the book believe. In fact, if you want the people of the book to hear, believe, and follow, what's the best way to do that? I mean, let's, let, me, let me put the shoe on the other foot again. How many times do you hear people using arguments that demonstrate they've never read the Quran? They will attack Muhammad for Aisha and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And, and they'll, they'll bring, you know, it's the stuff you hear all the time. And when you hear someone using arguments like that, what happens immediately in your mind? You don't give them any credit. They don't have any, they don't have any weight in your eyes. And so if, if the intention of these texts is actually to call the people of the book to truly follow after the truth, then you're going to use, well, even the Quran says, it says to you, you're to use, well, one translation is beautiful arguments, are you not? You're to use beautiful arguments in talking with the people of the book. Well, Allah can do that, can't he? I mean, if you can, then he can do it a whole lot better than you can, right? So where are these beautiful arguments that reflect what we actually believe? Because I can show you the earliest Christian responses to the Quran, such as that of Al-Kindi. And, uh, and the first thing he says is, your Quran says we believe in three gods, and we'll get to a second who those three are. That's not what we believe. Why should we follow when you're not actually describing what we believe? Now think about it. We are told to cease. I mean, there's some strong words we're going to see here. The reality is, when we ask, what is the three? There is pretty much unanimous opinion amongst the early tafsir and the early hadith of the Quran. And they all go back to Surah 5116. And you know what Surah 5116 says. Let me just jump up there and read it. And when Allah said, O Jesus, son of Mary, most interpret this as being the final day of judgment, did you say to mankind, take me and my mother for two gods other than Allah? He said, transcendent are you. It was not mine to say of which I had no right in saying it. Then you knew it. You know what is in myself, but I know not what is in yourself. It is you, only you, who know well all hidden things. Surah 5, 116. Many of the early commentators, Ibn Kathir, Ibn Abbas, all the way into later commentaries like Zamakshadi, they all say the same thing. The three of the Quran 
is Allah, Jesus, and Mary. Allah, Jesus, and Mary. That's not the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, well, I'll, 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 I'll give you one thing. There is a group that calls itself Christian where that's pretty close. They're called the Mormons. The problem is the Mormons didn't develop until 1830. In fact, they didn't even develop polytheism until 1838. So uh, I, I really don't think that's what Muhammad had in mind uh, in the Quran was something that was going to come 1,200 some odd years later. No Christians believe when they say three that we're talking about Allah and his wife or his consort and then the offspring, Jesus. I could see how someone looking at some Christian art that doesn't have a background might come to that, that conclusion, but Allah knew what the Trinity was in 632, right? So when it says three, I have to ask you so, I have to ask you a question. Three what? Well, three gods. Who are the three gods? Allah, Jesus, and Mary. We know that elsewhere in the Quran, for example, in Surah 39.4, if Allah had willed to take a son, he could have chosen anyone he pleased out of his creation. Transcendent is he, he is Allah, the one, the irresistible. Or in Surah 6.101, the originator of the heavens and the earth. How can he have a child when there is for him no consort, when he created all things and has knowledge of all things? No consort. This is the concept of sonship, but I can show you early church father after early church father, let alone the New Testament, that's never what we had in mind. That's never what the relationship of father and son is. As I showed you from the Gospel of John, the relationship of father and son is eternal. It's not in time. There is no wife. There is no heavenly mother. So why is the Quran referring to these things? Now, I know there are all sorts of gods, you know, the, the idols in the Kaaba uh, before the cleansing that, that Muhammad brings, uh, and they had gods who had daughters and sons and all the rest of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, you might want to say some of these texts are about that, but the reality is, again, even the early Tafsir literature tends to see all of these being related to one another. I can see if you pick and choose how you can get around it, but it seems very, very, very clear that that is what's going on here. Uh, I've got some quotations from Ibn Abbas, but I'm, um, I'm going to have to skip past that and just give you some of the other uh, texts that we need to look at. Now, uh, let, let, me, let me just, just mention uh, at least uh, the tafsir of uh, Al-Jalayim. So believe in Allah and his messengers. Do not say three gods, Allah, Isa, and his mother. There it is. Allah, Isa, and his mother. It is better that you stop saying these things. Affirming the divine unity is better. Well, that's not what we believe. And that's not what was believed at that particular point in time. There is one other that I do need to read for you, even if, even if time pushes me. This is very important. Here is Ibn Ishaq. Without Ibn Ishaq, you know almost nothing about the life of Muhammad. This is a very important source. Listen to this. There were Christians, according to the Byzantine rite, uh, this is about the people who met with Muhammad from Nedron, though they differed among themselves in some point, saying he is God, and he is the Son of God, and he is the third person in the Trinity, which is the doctrine of Christianity. They argued that he is God because he used to raise the dead, heal the sick, declare the unseen, and make clay birds and then breathe into them so that they flew away. By the way, even though that's in the Quran, that's from the Gnostic Gospels. That's not from the Gospel. That's not Christian. That's Gnostic. That's from a completely different worldview. And you have to ask yourself the question, why does the Quran say it actually happened when it's ahistorical? It didn't happen. And it comes from, and folks, you don't want the Gnostics. The Gnostics believe that the creator of all material things is an evil god. They would say that your Allah is an evil god. They would say that Jehovah was an evil god. You don't want to touch the Gnostics with a 10-foot pole. And yet that's where that story came from. Um, and all this was by the command of God Almighty. We will make him a sign to men. They argue that he is the son of God, and that they, they say he had no known father, and he spoke in the cradle. Again, that's in the Quran, but that comes from the Arabic infancy gospel from the 5th century. Uh, he spoke in, uh, spoke in the cradle, and this is something that no child of Adam has ever done. They argue that he is the third of three in that, in that God says, we have done, we have commanded, we have created, we have decreed. And they say, if he were one, he would have said, I have done, I have created, and so on. That he is he, and Jesus, and Mary. There's Mary again. Now listen to this. Concerning all these assertions, the Quran came down. Did you hear that? Concerning all these assertions, the Quran came down. The earliest source you have for the majority of Muhammad's life says that the Quran is directly interacting with this stuff, with these claims. That's amazing. 
because the reality is it doesn't interact accurately with these things. That's important because Ibn Ishaq said it, and like I said, that's a rather important source. Let's look at Surah 5. I need to at least read these in your hearing. O people of the book, Surah 5, 15. Now has our messenger come to you, expounding to you much of what you used to hide in the book. Notice it's still in the book in the days of Muhammad. And forgiving much, now there has come to you light from Allah and a clear book, whereby Allah guides all who seek his good pleasures to ways of peace and safety and leads them out of darkness by his permission to light and guides them to a straight path. They indeed have disbelieved who say, Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary. By the way, that's not our language. That's not what we say. That's not what we say. That's not how we would say it. That would make Jesus all of God, excluding the Father and the Son. That's not an accurate representation of what we believe. So maybe this is referring to somebody else, but it says they have indeed disbelieved who say Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary. Say who has the least power against Allah if he had willed to destroy the Messiah, son of Mary, and his mother. Why bring that up? Why mention the ability to destroy Mary? Unless Surah 5, 116 is exactly right, and the three of the Quran is God, Mary, and Jesus. If he had willed to destroy the Messiah, son of Mary, and his mother, and everyone on earth, Allah's is the sovereignty of the heavens and earth. Then Surah 5 continues on in Ayahs 68 and 72 through 77. Say, O people of the book, you have nothing of true guidance till you observe the Torah and the gospel and that which was sent down to you from your Lord. That's exactly what I'm trying to do tonight, gentlemen and ladies. Sorry. That's exactly what I'm trying to do tonight. I'm trying to find those things. I'm trying to follow those things. But you know what this means? These words would be meaningless if the Torah and the gospel did not exist in Muhammad's day. Because someone explain to me, Yusuf, please, in your time, even if you've got lots of slides or something, try to find the time to explain. If you don't believe that the, the law and the gospel exist in the day of Muhammad and had already been corrupted, what do these words mean? I'll read them again. You have nothing of true guidance till you observe the Torah and the gospel and that which was sent down to you from your Lord. That which was sent down to you, and then it, in parentheses it says, O Muhammad, from your Lord is certain to increase the transgression, disbelief of many of them, so grieve not for those who disbelieve. They have disbelieved who say, Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. Again, that's not our language. The Messiah himself said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever ascribes partners to Allah, for him Allah has forbidden paradise, his abode is the fire. For the unjust there will be no helpers. Point, real quick point. No critical scholar that Muslim apologists quote to attack the text of the New Testament will ever believe Jesus said those words. Not a one of them. Not a one of them. None of those liberal scholars would ever believe Jesus said those words. Even scales, my friends, even scales. But you have the warning against shirk. They have disbelieved, I-73. They have disbelieved to say, Allah is the third of three. Guess what the next phrase is? Exactly what I told you it would be. When there is no God save one God, if they cease not what they say, a painful torment will fall, fall upon those who disbelieve. By the way, this is really strong language. It's really strong language. And I'm not objecting to it. Because if you're right, then we need to be warned. I'm not like one of these politically correct people in our society that goes, oh, it's just terrible what it says. If it's true, you better say it clearly. And that's why I'm speaking clearly to you. And I hope you hear me. I hope you hear me. They have disbelieved who say, uh, Allah is the third of three. When there is no God save one God, if they cease not what they say, a painful torment will fall upon those who disbelieve. Will they not instead turn to Allah in repentance and seek his forgiveness? For Allah is forgiving and compassionate. The Messiah, son of Mary, was none other than, same limiting language, than a messenger before whom messengers had passed away. And his mother was a saintly woman. Listen closely. They both used to eat earthly food. What's the argument? You know what the argument is. If Jesus and Mary eat food, they can't be what? Gods. Is that a fair reading? Is that not reflective of exactly what's in the early tafsir? And that's not what any Christian ever believed. That's not what we believe. So, they both, eat, they both used to eat earthly food. See how we make the signs clear for them, then see how they follow falsehood. Another translation says, see how they are deluded. 
Say, do you worship in place of a law that which possesses for you neither harm nor benefit? A law it is who is the hearing and the knowing. O people, the book, exceed not in your religion, just as we saw in Surah 4, exceed not in your religion the bounds, and do not follow the vain desires of people who erred in times gone by and led many astray and strayed from the even road. I know who you're talking about in your prayers when you say, Wala Dalim. I know what the early Hadith says about that. And I know that Muhammad was asked who it is that earns God's wrath. It was the Jews. Who's been led astray? The Christians. I know. And I know what that's referring to. And what I'm asking you is why as a believing Christian who is trying to understand what the Quran says and yet knows my own history and my own scriptures, I know that Christians of that day did not believe what the Quran says they believed. What am I supposed to do with that? What am I supposed to do with that? That's the question. In Surah 345, when the angel said, O Mary, Allah gives, gives the glad tidings of a word from him whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, illustrious this world and the hereafter, and one of those who shall be brought near to Allah, he will speak to mankind in his cradle and in his manhood, and he is of the righteous. Here's why I raised this issue. I mentioned it earlier before. What sources does the Quran use? According to the Quran, none, right? He's not quoting from other sources. He's not using uh, ancient texts. Uh, there's nothing of man in the Quran whatsoever. And yet, the story of Jesus speaking from the cradle is found in the Arabic infancy gospel written about 150 years before Muhammad. The story of the birds comes from the infancy gospel of Thomas. We can, uh, critical scholars have identified literally hundreds of places in the Quran where sources are drawn from. So here's the question. When it comes to this issue, the Christology of the Quran, you can simply take the position, and Yusuf could get up here and say, look, the Quran's the word of God, therefore it's right, and whatever it says, and somebody down here is going to go, talk bear, and y'all going to go, Allahu Akbar. And that's all we, you know, we could have we skipped the whole evening if you're going to do that. Right? I mean, I almost asked for a talk beer a little while ago, you know? I was like, hey, come on, this is fair, right? <laughs> if that's all we're going to do, folks, we are never, ever going to advance in our understanding of each other. We're never going to get there. You have to ask some questions. You know, when my gospel, when my gospel went out into the world, it encountered Greek philosophy, it encountered Roman religion, and we had to start answering questions about the gospel in the language of the people that we were trying to reach. My question for you is, when are you going to start seriously wrestling with the questions about the Quran? Because you know what? When I have to seriously wrestle, I've debated atheists, I've debated all sorts of folks. When I have to seriously wrestle with their attacks upon my scriptures, guess what happens to me? My faith in my scriptures gets deepened, not because I just close my eyes, but because in studying it, I find out what the real truth is. I dig deeper into the text, and I see its beautiful harmony over time. So my invitation to you is, we need to ask, I, need, I need to ask each one of you the question. Why is it that the Quran represents the Trinity in a way that Christians did not believe? Are you going to tell me, well, there was this one little group maybe over here that didn't exist in Muhammad's day, but... Uh, you know, it's no longer relevant. You mean there's something written in Arabic on a heavenly tablet about a group that would no longer exist by the time it got revealed? Really? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Why is it that the Christology of the Quran is primarily informed by sources other than the Injil? Now, Yusuf is going to say, well, the Injil is just a single book given to Jesus. Here's the next question. Where does the author of the Quran show any knowledge of what the Injil actually is. It's never quoted. It's never quoted, and yet I'm held accountable for it. This same surah is gonna say to me, the people of the book, judge by what is contained therein. What did the Christian people have in the days of Muhammad by which to judge? What was the Injil? Even the Christians called the entirety of the New Testament by the one word, gospel, because it contained the entire message of Jesus Christ. And so here's the question. When Muhammad preached, when Muhammad preached, 
Did Allah expect the people who heard his words to understand what he said and respond to him? Did he? Yes, of course. I would think so. I mean, I suppose you can take the, the view that, no, actually, there's stuff in the Quran that Allah said it, and everybody sat there and went, huh? What? But that doesn't make any sense. You and I both know that when, uh, when Muhammad preached, he expected people to respond, yes? And so if that's the case, then when Muhammad spoke to the al al Jil in Surah 4, and he says, you are to judge by what is contained in the gospel. What does it mean? The gospel existed in the days of Muhammad. And my friends, we know exactly what gospel the Christians had. We know exactly what the New Testament looked like in the days of Muhammad. We have entire copies of the New Testament that predate Muhammad by centuries. And so all the stuff about corruption all of a sudden disappears because now your own Quran... You either have to say, well, it didn't have any meaning, the people couldn't understand it, they couldn't apply it, they couldn't obey it. Are you really going to say that the Quran contains commandments that the people to whom those commandments were addressed couldn't obey them? Or you're going to have to admit that even though it says to obey the Injil, the Quran doesn't understand what's in the Injil. That is a major issue that every one of us has to think about. And I don't want Yusuf to come up here and just repeat Islamic orthodoxy. I know Islamic orthodoxy. I've read all of Bukhari and Muslim. I know Islamic orthodoxy. I've read a lot of, of Ibn, Ibn Kathir. I, I know what the interpretation is. We've got to get past just repeating the basics and begin to interact and say, well, okay, I'll take that challenge. Here is where the Quran meaningfully interacts in such a way that the people of the gospel could be expected to really respond and to go, yeah, now there's something I can understand. That re accurately represents what I believe. That's where we've got to go, folks. That's what we've got to do. And so there are just a few texts that I've raised in your, in your hearing. And I can see some of you. You understand what I'm saying. You know what the issues are. And so let's think about them together, and not just tonight. If you don't reconsider these things over the course of the coming week, you've wasted your time, and Yusuf and I have wasted ours. We don't have to come to absolute conclusions tonight, but if we begin the dialogue in respect for one another, that may be one of the most important things that happens in this land, or maybe even this world this day. It's got to start somewhere, folks. Maybe it can start with us. What do you think? Thanks for listening. Okay, now, Yusuf, come forward. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, James, for that uh, enlightened presentation. Where are my students? Are they here? The students from our... Did we discuss what James was going to say for the session? Yes. Was I right? Everything he said? In general, we discussed the same. In fact, we had a discussion about your entire talk. It's not, <laughs> I never read your mind, but I knew the argument beforehand. And so nothing that James said this evening, particularly pertaining to the Quran, in fact, surprised me. I want to start on a positive note. We Muslims and Christians do believe that Jesus, in fact, was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believed he performed many miraculous deeds, although he was human. We believe he was a Messiah. We believe God exalted Jesus. In fact, as Ahmad Didat said, no Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. There are slight differences on the end of his life, but even there, there are agreements. So in a general sense, we basically agree. The one major point where there is a disagreement, which... Muslims have basically compromised in terms of believing, believing, believing. Now we're saying Christians need to come and start believing what Jesus really was. And that is pertaining to his personality. If you look in Surah 3 verse 59, it says, in, in The similitude of Jesus before God is like that of Adam. He created him from dust and then said to him, Kun fayakun, Be, and he was. Does that confront Christian belief? Of course, 
Because you don't believe that. You believe, in fact, he was divine. The Quran is going directly as a critique and pointing out to you that he's something what you should not, in fact, believe in. Now, it's important that when we look at scripture, and, and I spoke about this earlier on, and I have to emphasize this again, James came up with this, inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument, and I agree. When we look at both scriptures, why is it that when you look at the New Testament, you want to apply context? But when you want to look at the Quran, you don't apply context. And so I point the same thing out, that when we interpret scripture, generally the Bible and the Quran, you have to look at the text and the context. In other words, our interpretation has to be intertextual. It's only in the intertextual and contextual interpretations of the passages of the Quran that you basically be able to come to its particular meaning. I remember doing a debate with Jay Smith two years ago in Cape Town, and I pointed out to him certain passages like Surah 9 verse 5, Surah 8 verse 60, all these passages on violence. And when he came back in the rebuttal session, he never dealt with it, he never touched it. Because he could see that his argument was weak, it failed. But then just two weeks ago in a debate he had with Shabir Ali in Toronto, he brings the same points up again. Now that for me is deviousness. That is what I would call a duplicitous double agenda. You have to look at the text and you have to look at the context. And when you look at the contextual interpretations of the passages, you will even, for example, see who the Quran identifies when it speaks of Nasara and Ahl Kita. Let's look at something here. Why do this? Why do this? That's my question. Let the people of the gospel, Injil, judge by what God has revealed therein. Now, James, my understanding uh, from what I gather from you, I'm not, I don't want to interact, but my understanding is that that would basically mean the gospel that existed in the time of Muhammad, in the time of Prophet. Am I correct? Would that be your interpretation? That that's in his interpretation. But again, look at the principle I said, text, context. Now, it says here, let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed. Gospel, maybe Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These gospels existed. That is a gospel the Quran is referring to. What does the context refer, refer to? Context is what's in red. Now, why you leave out what's in red? We reveal to him, Jesus, the gospel. You don't believe Matthew was revealed to Jesus, Mark was revealed to Jesus, Luke was revealed to Jesus, John was revealed to Jesus. You believe, we believe, the, the Islamic belief, whether we believe in the existence or not of an Injil, the belief is that there is a singular gospel revealed to Jesus. You believe he is the revelation. You believe men were inspired to write. But what we have here are biographical accounts about Jesus. You see, Matthew says that Jesus went to a place and he preached the gospel. Mark said that he went to another place and he preached the gospel. Luke said he went to another place and he preached the gospel. John said he went to another place and he preached the gospel. Now, what did Jesus have? Did he have Matthew? Did he have Mark? Did he have Luke? Did he have John? Did he carry it under his arm like a missionary would do today? Did he have the epistles of Paul? Would he have Colossians, Galatians? What did he preach? What was the gospel? That is a gospel that the Quran refers to. So then in that context it says, look at black, let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed therein. Therein the gospel revealed to Jesus. And then it goes on universally. Verse 50, if any to fail by what Allah has revealed, God has revealed, they are no better than transgressors. So universal. Singular, revelation to Jesus. Then gospel, referring to the gospel to Jesus. Then universal, whatever God has revealed, no better than transgressors. If you don't judge by that. But it doesn't even stop there. If you look at verse 51, it says then, To thee, Muhammad, we reveal scripture, confirming what came before it. Meaning, confirming that. And acting as a quality control. A muhaminan, a muhaminan alayhi. Muhaminan alayhi, a quality control, a guardian, a check. What's a quality control? If you are at a store or you're at a factory and you're acting as a quality control, what do you do? You do away with the rejects. You get away with the rejects. So similarly, what is in the Gospels today as they exist, which we can confirm in the Quran, the Quran accepts it. What is not correct, what is incorrect, the Quran would reject it. So in that context, it basically does not refer to the Gospels, but the Gospel revealed to Jesus. Does that make sense? So can you see, if you look at one particular verse, you may, can have an idea. If you look at the next verse, reading it in its entire context, it gives you an... So again, goes back to the point, inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument. 
if you demand that we be consistent in understanding and engaging in your scripture, which we should, then why are you so inconsistent when you deal with the Quran? You know why? Because at the back of your mind, you believe, you have a presupposition, a presumption, engaging in presupposition apologetics, that the Quran is not the word of God. So now you have to develop arguments or bring up arguments to confirm that particular position. I would rather say, leave aside your prejudice, leave aside your bias, and look at the particular passage. I pointed the same thing out to Jay, I think, in a previous discussion. And then later on in Hyde Park, he does the same thing. My question is, why? Why do that? Can't we be honest in terms of engaging in scripture? I don't profess to be an expert in Greek. I try and present what are the works of Greek scholars, who you probably uh, have objection to, but at least maintain the same consistency when it comes to the Quran. Now, we're looking at Arabia, the context in which, you see, I, I assumed, I knew what the argument was tonight. I already knew what James was going to say. And James is saying, the basic thrust is, how is the Quran addressing people who didn't believe in what they have? Well, thanks to a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Shabir Ali, uh, he recommended this book to me, The Bible in Arabic, The Scripture of the People of the Book in the Language of Islam by Sidney Griffiths. Have you, have you come across? You haven't come across this book yet. This book, this particular individual, he's a scholar. He's a specialist in Arab Christianity, in the history of Arab Christianity. He's a specialist. We'll focus on a bit of his writings. Basically, he goes on to suggest, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, James. You're very honorable. You're an honorable man. Of, no, don't, don't do that. We don't want to intimidate James. We don't want to intimidate myself. He's doing that for me. Come on. Oh, yeah. He did that for James. <laughs> Certainly. Takbir. <laughs> okay. What basically, what Sidney Griffiths says, Sidney Griffiths is an Arabic scholar. And what he says is that in the context of the 6th century, recognizing the Quran's Christians, a wealth of information that exists, he says that scholars have basically gathered evidence providing that the major Christian communities in Arabia were the Malkites, the Jacobites, and the Nestorians. That's in, in the historical context in, whom the, in which the Quran was in fact addressing. And he, he quotes on a book by a world-renowned scholar called Irfan Shahid, Rome and the Arabs, uh, a pro to the study of Byzantium and the Arabs, Byzantium and the Arabs in the 4th century, in the 5th century, in the 6th century, in volumes 1 and 2. It basically deals with the identity of the Arab Christians in the immediate pre-Islamic context. And what Sidney Griffiths points out is that these Christians, in fact, did have the beliefs that you claim those Christians never in fact possessed. On a universal level today, we would argue that the Quran in fact addresses you as Christians. I don't take the view of, of Bassam Zawadi. I saw that debate where he tried to give a particular presentation that it could be referring to heretics and so on. It does refer to you, but historically it referred to these particular Christians. The historical record, according to Sidney Griffiths on page 13, says, preserves no memory of any significant Christian presence among the Arabs or in their environments from the crucial period from the 5th to the, sixth, uh, to the first third of the 7th century. You see, James, if you have to challenge this position, what Sidney Griffiths pointed out, what Irfan Shahid pointed out, that the Malkites, Jacobites, and the Nestorians were part and parcel in the first half of the 7th century in Arabia, living within that context. If you want to challenge that, then you have to give me source material or a scholarly authority, which I can then examine to rebut this particular presumption here, which is based on archaeological study and so on and so forth. So what is your agenda for tonight? I need to ask. I need to ask James. I need to ask some of us sitting here. I need to ask myself, what is the agenda? The aim of the inquiry is to determine which Christian doctrines in particular the Quran's text envisions, because we're dealing with Christology, and ask whether or not its biblical echoes, uh, echoes and allusions reflect the presence of the Bible in Arabic in its pre-immediate foreground. Now at the outset, and James agrees with me, the first Arabic Bible dates to about the 9th, 10th century. So there was no Arabic Bible that was there present in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. He had no access to an Arabic Bible. Griffiths on page 28 goes on to say, the Christian doctrines and practices criticized in the Quran were those espoused by mainly Christian communities whose presence in pre-Islamic times seems likely. 
Ebionites and the Nazarenes who flourished in the fourth centuries, the present writer is skeptical of their claims. Of course, this is one scholarly view against other scholarly views that may exist, but the vast majority of scholars on historic Arab Christianity or Christians in uh, pre-Islamic Arabia and of course Islamic Arabia agrees on this particular issue and I've yet to see someone meaningful come and challenge this particular hypothesis. It is in the Medina surahs that the Quran addresses Christians polemically criticizing their distinctive particular practices. From a historic point of view Sidney Griffith says the Quran would have been addressing the Malkites, the Jacobites or the Nestorians either collectively or individually depending on the context of the critique. Does that make sense? You see, James says it doesn't identify who these Christians were. No Christians believe in it. But Griffiths points out that these Christians in fact existed. And so the critique, historically at least, in the Quran, dealt with specifically those communities, like the Malkites, and I'll deal with it in detail, that espoused to certain particular views. At the outset, one needs to understand that the Quran never addresses Jews and Christians as believers. It addresses the Ahl al-Kitab scripture people some 54 times. One has to determine from the context which community in particular the text is addressing at a specific and particular interest. Now, the theological mistrust has two components, one of which revolves around the fact that Christianity has been transformed into a cult of Jesus. The Islamic view is quite unequivocal. In Surah 19, verse 32, verse 4, it says, Behold, I am a servant of God. He has vouched me revelation, made me a prophet, made me blessed where I may be, and he has enjoined on me prayer, charity, so peace is on me. Such was the words of Jesus, the son of Mary, whose nature they so deeply disagree. Now, now is the Quran not engaging you, James? Is the Quran not engaging the fact that they disagreed with the nature of Christ? In the 4th century, in the 3rd century, in the 2nd century, even in the time of pre-Islamic Arabia and during the time uh, when uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad came on the scene. If we look at the article of faith in the articles of the Apostolic Creed, page 33, Theodor Zan, the article of faith uh, was up until 150, I believe in God, the Almighty. Between 180 to 210, the word Father was added before Almighty, which was obviously bitterly contested by a number of leaders, Bishop Victor, Bishop Zephyrus, condemned it and opposed the tendency to disregard Jesus as divine and stressed on the unity of God as expressed in the original teachings of Jesus. So there was a dispute. Now, when the Quran addresses a particular community, when the Quran uh, says in Surah 19, the nature that they disagree about, is it not correct? Is there no disagreement? Is there? Of course. The Quranic critique of Christian belief was revealed in a time when, historically speaking, believing that Jesus was not God was becoming increasingly dangerous. And I'll explain why. Let's look at Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyons in southern France. He criticized Paul for uh, rejecting, the do in, in injecting pagan doctrines and Greek philosophy. What happened to him? He was murdered. Lucian, great knowledge of Hebrew and Greek, he believed that Jesus was not equal to God, was subordinate to him. He was tortured several times, put to death in 312. Arius, born in Libya, became Bishop of Alexandria, student of Lucian. The Arian controversy, he believed in absolutely one God, said that the, the act of generation, note he speaks about generation. The Quran condemns the sonship from the perspective of generation. That was a belief that was there is attributed to God. Then he destroys the singularity of God and describes corporeality, having a body, which is the attribute of man. He believed that Jesus was, born, was a man born miraculously without a father and that he was a messenger of God. What was he? Muslim, in a broad speaking. I'm not going to focus on the Council of Nicaea, but effectively you had two camps, Athanasius, Arius, and at these camps, basically, some sort of consensus was reached what the nature of Christ is, what the nature of God is, and of course the Athanasian Creed that came along with it. However, the New Catholic Encyclopedia, James has issues with Catholics, but I would, I would give them the benefit of the doubt. We had noted Catholic scholars, Raymond Brown and so on. The New Catholic Encyclopedia says that there is a growing recognition on the part of exegetes and biblical theologians that one should not speak of Trinitarianism without serious qualification. 
Trinitarianism only evolved in the 4th century. You see, James said, and he made the point that the Quran doesn't identify the Trinity. It speaks about don't say three. Correct? It doesn't identify who the three are in that verse. Does the New Testament identify who the three are? Does the New Testament identify who the Trinity is? You see, the only verse which said and identified explicitly what the Trinity was, was the first epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. That is the closest approximation. I challenge you, James, show me anything better than that. That, that, would, be the found, that would be the best argument for the Trinity, the Coma Johannium, the first epistle of John chapter 5. Verse. Show me something better than that in the New Testament. Go baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say the three are one. Here it says three are one. And we now obviously know that that verse is a fabrication. So the foundation of your faith, which identifies what the Trinity is, is a fabrication. Why do you take issue then with the fact when the Quran doesn't in fact identify what the Trinity is explicitly? We are told to disbelieve Trinity, three, triune Godhead, in a general sense. It's not our business to go and define what the Trinity is. That's your business. That's your belief. But when your book doesn't define it accurately, how do you take issue with the fact that the Quran is now silent on this particular point? In a previous discussion that James had in a slide, uh, this, is, this is James' slide. James never had his slide. He never, but this is James' slide. So I'm just assisting him on that. James says the Trinity's most basic assertion is that there is one God. There is no association in Trinitarian theology as this requires a polytheistic belief. So he questions, why does the Quran respond to Trinity with assertions of monotheism? Why? He takes issue with the fact that this is a, he's a monotheist. This is polytheism. Why does the Quran even make that, dare to make that assumption? Well then, and, and quoting Han Kanegraaf, this is what James says, and I mentioned this earlier. He says, we, we have to realize that we are talking about the one what and the three who's. The Father is not one-third God, Son one-third, Spirit one-third God. Each is fully God. Father is God, fully. Son is God, fully. Holy Spirit is God, fully. How many gods are there or how many are there? One. That's what he says. Now, now the point is, um, no, no, let, let's not laugh. This is not a mockery, it's not a laughing matter. The point, it's a serious matter. The point is, if, if the problem is with your understanding, why do you accuse the Quran of now, when it, when it basically suggests that this is in fact polytheism? And I ask the question, is it because at a subconscious level? I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I'm being serious. At a, at a conscious level, you're a monotheist, but at a subconscious level, is it perhaps because you are in fact a polytheist? You see, this is a belief. James never, I'm going to explain this grammatically. Well, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. Now, what is this? But they are one. Co-equal, co-eternal. They're one. X is not equal to Y. X is equal to Y. Z is equal to Y. But X is not equal to Z. And when you say that, it creates problems. You can't then claim to be a monotheist. So when the Quran deals with that polemically, it deals with this particular, the implications of this belief. That's what the Quran is in fact focusing on. You see at a subconscious level, you have three mental pictures. When you say in the name of the Father, you have a certain mental picture, right? When you say in the name of the Son, you have a certain mental picture. When you say in the name of the Holy Spirit, you have a certain mental picture. There are three distinct mental pictures. And so hard as you may try, you cannot superimpose them and say that there is one. But when I ask you, how many do you see? You say you see one. So even though you correct the normal terminology used when Christians say the Father is a person, the Son is a person, the Holy Spirit is a person, but they're not three persons but one person. You say the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Spirit is a person, but they're not three persons but one being. You're actually saying the same thing, James. And that becomes a problem. And so at a fundamental level, the Quran deals. There's nothing different from this to what is contained here. Tammuz, Nimrod, and in fact, Samirimus. Samirimus was initially included in the pagan Babylonian trinity as the Holy Spirit, the dove. Can you see that? Uh, Nimrod, the father. Tammuz, the son. This is from paganism. Now, looking at Surah 4, verse 71, O people of the book, 
Do not go beyond the bounds of your religion and do not say of God anything but the truth. Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, is no more than an apostle of God. The, uh, uh, the Messiah, the son of Mary, is, and he would cast into Mary. And do not say Trinity, do not say three, desist it. It'll be better for you, for your God is one. Now James says that the reference, be, that, that this reference to son, the Trinity, the three, is a direct reference to Mary. That it's Allah, Jesus, and Mary. Because it doesn't identify. So he juxtaposes what's contained in Surah 5 verse 119. Now the problem with that is, firstly, Sidney Griffiths points out that the reference of Jesus as Mary's son is most take, evidently taken rhetorically as a polemical corrective to the usual Malkite, Jacobite, and Nestorian habit of speaking of Jesus as the son of God. So they say he's the son of God. The Quran says he's a son of Mary. Does the Quran confuse the Trinity as referring to Jesus, Mary, and Allah? Now I must ask you and warn you, James. I'm, uh, well, I'm not saying it personally, but I'm, I'm saying warn uh, Christian polemicists. Stay away. Stay away from low-level internet arguments. Internet arguments particularly we wish to be taken seriously. I do understand he quoted Ibn Kathir, he quoted Tafsir Jalalain, but in a general sense the vast majority of Muslim scholars do not ascribe to the fact that the Trinity consists of Allah, Jesus and Mary. The vast majority. There is a religious fanatic, a nutcase from the United States. I had some dealing with him some years back. His name is Shamoon. He writes from the Answering Islam website. I don't know if you know him James, but he, he came with the same kind of argument. He's not the originator of the argument, but the point is that when you bring up such arguments about uh, the Quran confusing the Trinity as referring to Allah, Jesus, and Mary, no Muslim is going to take you seriously. No one's going to take you seriously. You see, if you, if you look at Surah 5, verse 116, O Jesus, the son of Mary, uh, uh, have you said to people, take me and my mother as two gods in derogation of God? Firstly, if... I take it, James, that, that you have a fairly rudimentary understanding of Arabic, am I correct? And you've studied Arabic. The word is, Do not take me and my mother as two gods in place of God. So at the very outset, this verse doesn't even speak about the Trinity. It speaks about the divinization of Jesus and Mary in place of God. It's not saying Allah is God. Jesus is God, Mary is God, he's not saying that. Sidney Griffiths, in the book on page 35, in dealing with this particular passage, says, rhetorically speaking, the verse cannot be taken as evidence that the Quran supposes that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is a member of the Christian Trinity. Rather, God's question to Jesus puts in high relief what the Quran thereby highlights as being, from its point of view, the absurd corollary of the Christian belief that since Jesus is the Son of God, then his mother must also somehow be God. That's what he deals with. And he goes on to explain, the passage in fact recalls the then current theological controversy dividing the Syriac and Aramaic speaking Jacobite and Nestorian Christians in the Quran's own milieu over the propriety and the veracity of the Marian title. You see, they refer to Mary as Theodokos, the mother of God. You see, if Jesus is God, the mother of God must him somehow be divine. And so that was in the, so, so now, this is what Griffiths points out. You said earlier on, James, in your discussion, that why does the Quran deal with a belief that these people never believed in? But I'm pointing out to you that this is what was in fact believed. The, the Aramaic speaking, the Jacobite and the Nestorian Christians, they in fact believed. The Malkites never believed that. The Jacobites, and in fact believed, and that was present in the, in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. The other problem we have is this is that if on the assumption, right, uh, I see times running out, that the Quran refers to, let, let, let's give James the benefit of the doubt, right? Let's give James the benefit of the doubt, that in Surah 5, verse 116, the Quran refers to Allah, Jesus, and Mary. And that somehow the other must be read with Surah 4, verse 171. Now here's where I say that inconsistency is a sign of a failed argument. If James is consistent in that, then he needs to be also consistent with Surah 9, verse 31. Because in Surah 9 verse 31, this is what it reads. They take their priests and the anchorites 
to be their lords in derogation of God, together with Jesus. Now in Surah 9 verse 31, it speaks about the priests and Jesus being taken as divine in derogation of Allah. So why don't you say then, you could easily say, well then the Trinity comprises of Jesus, it comprises of the priests, and it comprises of Allah. Why don't you apply the same argument? And, 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 and there was a hadith, I think, which mentioned that uh, when someone accepted Islam, a Christian, he said, we don't take our priests basically as God. And, and effectively, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that this was the idea of where you give them authority. It doesn't mean that you literally take them as gods in the absolute sense. So what prevents that particular reading in Surah 9 verse 31, James, from what you contain in Surah 5 verse 116? You see, when we talk about context, when James had to apply the context in Surah 5, Ayah 47 about the gospel, he doesn't apply the context. When he refers to Surah 4 verse 171, then he wants to appeal to the context. But he appeals to the context badly because he looks at one particular surah and then he juxtaposes it with some other particular chapter which deals with a totally different issue. Why do you do that? I take the same point that you take. I would not want to abuse your scripture. Why would you take the same issue of abusing my particular scripture because you want to make a certain theological point? So this is what... Um, this is what uh, Sidney Griffiths basically points out. Again, the Quran consistently teaches in varying phrases that God has no sons. How could he have an offspring not having a female consort? It is not for God to take a son. Ittakhadu. Ittakhadu could also mean take a son, as in the priests and anchorites take. Some translators have translated it as begotten a son. Now, this is also in direct reference to the idea of what it meant when someone said that a son was begotten. The innovated concept of Jesus being the only begotten son of the Father was developed in the 4th century. It was injected by Jerome into the Latin Bible to refute the claims made by Bishop Arius that, uh, and his associate, that Father alone was really God and Jesus was made and not begotten. Raymond Brown in the Anchor Bible, volume 29, talked to Paul B. Duff. So that was a belief that Jesus was begotten. The belief of generation was there. If you look at the letter from Paul P. Duff to uh, uh, assistant Professor George Washington University dated 1992. John 3.16 and John 1.18 each have the word monogonese in Greek. That means of a single kind, unique. Well, would that be correct? Of a single kind? That is correct. As a result, unique is a good translation. The reason you sometimes find a translation that renders the word as only begotten has to do with an ancient heresy within the church. In response to the Arian claims that Jesus was made, not begotten, Jerome translated the Greek term monogonese into Latin unigenitus, uh, uh, unigenitus, only begotten. So that was a heresy existent in the church where they believed that Jesus was birthed through an act of generation, only begotten. And begetting does have a sexual nature. Begetting does mean sexual. So the Quran was in fact dealing with that ancient heresy. So for you to now take an objection to the fact, why is it that the Quran approaches the sonship of Jesus from the, on the basis of generation, how can he have a son when he has no consort? Well, that was a belief that in fact exists. You may not have that belief, but up to recently, in the King James Version, that belief was in fact there. Many Christians believe. They say, Jesus is the only begotten son. Begotten, not made. What are you trying to emphasize when you say begotten, not made? Didat, in certain respects, was vindicated in respect of that, even though you claim he was wrong. I'd leave you with one little passage here. You see, detailing the birth of Jesus, and I want to point out a particular point. I believe time's almost at a premium, but I would like to, if, if I, um, I don't want to take any further time on this particular score. If, we, if, it, if it's possible, if we could give James just an additional two or three minutes, uh, would that be fine with you, James? You don't want, you don't want me? I'll, I'll just wrap up on this particular point. The birth of Jesus is mentioned in the Quran and in the New Testament. In the Quran, the question is, how shall I have a son when no man hath touched me? The Quran replies, even so Allah creates what he wills. When he hath decreed a plan, he but says to it, be, and it is. When you contrast that with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 35, the answer that we're given in direct reference to this is, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. The word in Greek is, kaiho uh, angelos apokritus auta apen hegion pneuma Epi lucitai, epi sekai, dynamis, hippisistu. Basically, 
it gives the idea, it gives an earthly description. Now my question to you is this. You compare this particular passage and you compare what's contained in the New Testament. If the Quran is a forgery, James believes it is not true, then how is it possible that a forgery in terms of description on the birth and the annunciation of Christ can be better than the original? And I'll leave you on that point. Thank you very much. I think, I think in all fairness, I've taken a minute or two, I've counted my clock. Uh, all fairness, James also needs to be given in the rebuttal time and additional time. Unfortunately, I'm not as punctual as he is, or Shabir Ali for that matter. Okay, we'll have 10, uh, 12 minutes rebuttal. Away. Well, we almost got there. I, I confess I'm disappointed. Um, I was hoping for a contextual Islamic reading of those particular texts. Instead, I got attacks on Jay Smith, Sam Shamoon. Uh, we had conspiracy theories about Irenaeus being murdered. Well, that's a new one. I teach church history, and if he was killed, it was by the Romans uh, as a part of persecution of Christians, but it was because he said something about Paul. Absolutely no scholar I know of has any, uh, meaningful scholar has any, we got stuff about Arius, we got, got low-level internet arguments, one plus one plus one equals one. The standard, and then, and then 1 John 5, 7, uh, with all due respect, since he brought up low-level internet arguments, excuse me of it. 1 John 5, 7, one plus one plus one equals one, those are low-level internet arguments, and my friends, until Muslims get past that level, we will never have meaningful dialogue. We will never have meaningful dialogue. Why do I take the time to understand the forms of Tawheed and hence the levels of shirk when the best Islam has to offer won't get past the fact that 1 John 5, 7 was irrelevant to the development of the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not a part of the New Testament. We've known that for a long time. We've explained this for hundreds of years. How are we ever going to get beyond this? That's low-level internet arg argumentation. And soon you're going, well, you, you believe the Father is fully God and the Son is fully God, and that makes three gods. No, there's one being of God shared by three persons. You've got to at least try to address the difference between being and person. I've already explained it. No attempt to do so. It's just so much easier to just play on prejudice. It's so much easier to play on prejudice. And I'm disappointed. Because, well, you know, uh, I mean, the number of things that were brought up here were amazing. Evidently, what's being suggested is that even though Muhammad in his day would have known about the argumentations concerning, concerning Theotokos and the Nestorians, and that's the background of the usage there, he knows all that stuff, but wait a minute, then why isn't there any clear statement of what the doctor is? Well, because you people didn't know. Yes, we did. All these people would have agreed that Mary, for example, was not a deity. That wasn't at, at issue. Exaltation of Mary and stuff like that to the level of deity, that has nothing to do with Theotokos. Theotokos is a Christological title. It's a title of, it's saying that the one who was born of Mary was truly God. There's just so many of these things here that in, in even 12 minutes, I could not even begin to respond to them. And if I did, here's the problem. Um, we wouldn't actually get to the subject of what we're supposed to be talking about. And so I'm going to focus on one thing in the few minutes that I have. I was accused of a lot of things. And I'm glad we're recording this because then you can watch the video when it goes on YouTube. You can listen to the audio. You can start and stop it. You can look up stuff. And I challenge you to do that. Please do that. Don't, don't believe what I have to say. I mean... When Yusuf is putting images up of Semiramis and, and trying to say it has something to do with the Trinity, that is so disappointing. I might as well sit here and say Allah is the moon god. It's just, just as bad an argument. It's just as fallacious. It's just as ridiculous to any serious-minded person. It's so disappointing to me. I hope for such better. But let me try at least to respond to the accusation that you've been inconsistent in your dealing with the Quran. I w read through the Quran. I read more of the Quran than I needed to give so it would be context. He says, you went someplace else that had nothing to do with that. Where? He didn't give, us, he didn't give me an example. In fact, he ended up going to the same text I did as if they were relevant. 
Accusations with no foundation. But I want to look primarily at Surah 547. Let the people of the gospel judge by the law has revealed it. He says, you didn't do this intertextually and all the rest of this stuff. Okay, let's try in the seven minutes that I have left to speak to you to listen to this text and see what it says to us. Did I mishandle it? Did I, did I quote it out of context? I submit to you, I did not. What does it mean? I'm not really sure what we were being told it meant. It seems that Yusuf is assuming a meaning of the term Allah, a term in Jeel in this text, without demonstrating and proving from us that the Quranic definition is correct. What I'm saying is it would be very easy to misunderstand what the people of the book said about their scriptures because they would refer, and we even to this day refer to the gospel as a general summary of all of the New Testament teachings, and we also refer to individual books. Where's the evidence the author of the Quran knew what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were? Where's the evidence? I've not seen an, an, an iota offered. The author of the Quran didn't know. And so there's no interaction with that. There's no interaction in what's in those Gospels, and there's no interaction with what the people of the book actually believed the Gospel was. The assumption is made that this was something given to Jesus. Well, we would agree in the sense that Jesus said that his apostles would be dwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit of God would lead them into all truth. So that does come from Jesus, but that's sort of irrelevant because the Quran doesn't understand that either. Let's listen to the text one more time and see if I'm being inconsistent and acontextual. And let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. What does therein refer to? Grammatically. Fihi, what's the antecedent? The gospel. That's the only thing in the Arabic that is the antecedent. So how can we, the people of the gospel, judge by something we no longer possess? How can we do it? Is not the assumption of this text, and if you can show me something in the context that changes this, please do. I wasn't shown anything that changes this. All I was just thrown out there, you reading it acontextually. I'm trying to read it contextually, and I want to ask, what does it mean? You can ask me, what does 2 Corinthians 13, 14 mean? Which is a Trinitarian passage, by the way. What does Matthew 28, 19, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit? You can ask me what that means, and I'll tell you. So I'm asking you. I am one of the people of the gospel. This is addressed to me. What am I supposed to do with it? Who am I supposed to judge? What am I supposed to judge? How am I supposed to judge by if I no longer have the gospel? If, it, if the gospel was a book given to Jesus that had disappeared by the days of Muhammad, how could anyone to whom this was addressed and anyone down through the centuries thereafter obey this text? How am I supposed to obey the Quran in light of your beliefs? If I can't, then doesn't it make it meaningless? Now, you, now you, it, how is that a low-level internet argument? I'm looking at it, and I think that's a very fair question. Because it says, whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed. Um, that just referred to the gospel. Then it is those who are defiantly disobedient. I don't want to be defiantly disobedient. And yet this text is saying to me, judge by the Injil, just as the Jews were told in the preceding section to judge by the Torah. Now we know the Torah still exists. We know that because even the Quran says that it's like the, it's like, it's like the Quran itself. No one could ever write a book like it. So we know the Torah still existed in this day. So if the Injil didn't exist, how do, how do these words make any sense? You can make accusations and try to get people's emotions going, but that doesn't actually answer the question. Now, there's all sorts of interesting questions about the Melkites, Jacobites, and the Historians. I know what those people believed. I know what their differences were. And if you're actually telling me that now the Quran actually understands those differences, that makes things a lot worse. It makes things a lot worse for you because now you don't just have ignorance of the Trinity in general and no meaningful interaction with that. Now you don't have any meaningful interaction with the differences between these various Christological controversies. I mean, if the best you can come up with is, well, you know, they did use the term Theotokos, and it does refer to Mary, and so maybe that's the background, that only makes things worse, because if this is supposed to be Mubinun, if it's supposed to be clear, if it's supposed to be the final revelation, then now we should have even more 
intertextuality. He used that term, but I, I don't think Yusuf wanted to use intertextuality. Because, you see, intertextuality is what you have in the relationship between the Old and New Testaments. It's what you don't have between the Quran and the preceding revelations. So, what I had hoped for, what I had really hoped for in the response, was a Muslim reading, not stuff about Irenaeus, or, or conspiracy theories, or semiramis, or any of this other stuff that is just completely irrelevant to what we're actually talking about especially because it's just so far removed from any historically meaningful theory in regards to the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, or quotes from Raymond Brown and people that, again, are so far off on the left that they would never believe, Raymond Brown would never believe that a single word of the Quran quoted to Jesus, ascribed to Jesus, was true. Not a one. Why'd he quote him? Why'd he quote him? He would never believe that there's anything historical in the Quran about Jesus at all. Well, he wouldn't have. He's dead, but uh, he wouldn't have. Even scales. Okay, last minute. This is the last chance I'm going to have to say anything to you. First of all, to every one of you, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. Thank you. You've been listening. Even when I take my glasses off, I can see. You're, you guys stuck through the end. You may disagree with me. You may think, man, you've talked about stuff that I'm not sure about. But I hope you understand there's one thing that's true tonight. There's a man that flew from Phoenix, Arizona to stand in his stocking feet in your masjid and to try to talk to you because I love you. I care about you. I care first about my God and his truth. We don't agree. We need to argue, but we can argue with respect for one another. And I hope if you've heard anything, you've at least heard that. Check us out. Check out his, his writings. Listen to him carefully. Check out my writings. Listen carefully to me, even if I'm different. It's amazing what I've learned about you guys by honestly listening to people like Sheikh Yasser Qadi and listening to what they have to say. It's enriched my understanding of where you're coming from, and it's helped me to be more clear in my, even in my objections. Please do that. Thank you, and God bless all of you this evening. Thank you, James, and I really appreciate your time. I mean, we, I, I love James. I like him because he's probably one of the most decent apologists that you find in the world today and lots of people engage in polemics and lots of people engage in just scoring of points. I do, I do recognize James's sincerity and I think we need to acknowledge that. Now, James pointed out one thing that effectively I was engaging in a low level internet debate when I brought up the picture of Samirmus. No, the point I was showing there was I wasn't trying to find any sort of relationship with what's contained in ancient Babylonian belief systems with what's contained in the Christian Trinity. James normally asks this question about who does the Trinity identify? What is the triune Godhead that it speaks about? And so I basically presented a slide there which effectively showed that that was also a belief common in Babylonian times. They believe in three gods. James obviously believes that there are three persons manifest in one being. When I say that, I'm not misrepresenting his faith. That is a Christian belief. That you believe that there are three persons manifest in one being. For a Muslim, as difficult as it may be to say to you, that is polytheism. That is shirk. I don't misrepresent your belief. I understand your point. I understand your point when you say that the Father is 100% God, the Son is 100% God, the Holy Spirit is 100% God, but they are not three separate gods, they're one. That is your perspective. But at the end of the day, the Quran deals with it and it identifies it as shirk. And unfortunately, that would be deemed as one of the gravest sins. James brought up the issue of Surah um, uh, 5 verse 75. Let, not the, uh, let the people judge according to the gospel. Let the people judge therein. But in the passage just before that, the verse, it identifies what the gospel was. And the point I wanted to make was not so much of the fact that ways in Jeel that the Quran speaks about. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke. The point is a principle, which at a fundamental level you also accept. Because you accept that when Jesus preached in his three years prior to his demise, he never spoke the Greek language 
He preached probably in Aramaic. You don't even have his original words. At a, at, a, at a fundamental level, you also believe that there was a gospel which he in fact preached. But the gospels that you have, even on the assumption that they're accurate and they can be traced back and reconstructed back to the originals, even on that assumption, that would not be sufficient because there would be biographical accounts about Jesus as opposed to what Jesus preached. If you take a red letter Bible, you would see that all the words of Jesus are in red. It won't be able to fill even two columns of a newspaper. 90% of the words are in black. And that is a problem. When the Quran speaks about corruption of scripture in Surah 2 verse 79, it says, فَوَيْلُ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابَ بِأَيْدِهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَذَا مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ Woe to those who write the books with their own hands and then say, this is from God. If this doesn't deal with the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, then who is it speaking about? The Quraysh had no written scripture. The pagans had no written scripture in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. It can only be referring to you. Then woe to those who write with the books with their own hands and then say, this is from God, to traffic from it from a miserable price. Woe to them for what their hands do write and woe to them for what they gain thereby. That is a direct reference to your belief, to your book, to your scripture. James never addressed, and of course this is my rebuttal, he never addressed the fundamental point that you don't accept the Quran and we respect your belief. You don't believe in the Quran. If you look at a simple passage like the Annunciation, both of us believe in the same thing, that Jesus was born by a special miracle. But when you compare the Quranic reference to the birth of Christ and you compare the biblical reference to the birth of Christ, there are significant differences. Even though we believe the same thing, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. That does create certain linguistic implications for an atheist. He may well ask, how did the Holy Spirit come upon Mary? How did the Almighty overshadow her? We know it's an immaculate conception. But the question at the end of the day is, how is it possible that a forgery, which for centuries the Christian world was alleging that the Quran is, how is it possible that a forgery, in respect of a passage detailing the Annunciation of Christ, can be far better than the original? And that's a deeper question we need to look at. I do believe I was consistent in my argument on Surah uh, 5 verse 116 James tried to address the whole idea of Theotokos but you see he never came back to the idea which he originally mooted and presented that the Quran confuses the Trinity with Allah, Mary and Jesus he had his rebuttal session it's not the opening statement he had his rebuttal he never came back to it which means I'm hopeful that he accepts my particular interpretation that you cannot juxtapose the two passages together. Because if you were to juxtapose what was contained in Surah 5, 1, 1, 6, then you would have to accept what's contained in Surah 9, verse 31, when it refers to priests and anchorites being taken as gods in derogation of God. Why not apply the same standard there? I want to I I end on a positive note, basically, in the seven minutes that I basically have. In anthropomorphic depictions of God in the book by Zulfikar Ali Shah. He says, throughout history, Christians have been trying to make sense of God, accepting anthropomorphic images of him, yet disagreeing as to what these mean, whilst at the same time trying to save the transcendent God from corporeality and anthropomorphism. Regardless how much is this notion of a corporeal, triune God, the Bibles, and or Jesus' teachings, and how much the result of supplemental additions by the church fathers of later centuries. When Jesus said, my father is greater than I, he was demonstrating his voluntary subordination to the father. When he says, I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. When he went to the garden of Gethsemane, we are told that he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God and said, Oh my Father, if it be possible, let this burden pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, 
But is that all? Do these, wor do these verses have no meaning? Do these verses have absolutely no meaning? Now how is it that at a fundamental level you read these passages and still have a preconceived notion that this particular individual is triune, is part of the triune Godhead and is unique. And so, according to the formula, we would basically say that the modality and language essentially structured in such a way in the Quran as to allow many possibilities of communication without making God resemble or disappear in the world he has created. This type of transcendental concept is pervasive throughout the Quran, the authentic Hadith literature, and through the history of Islamic civilization. I want to end with this point and this passage to James, whom I love. I love all of you. I love my Christian friends here. This is what the passage of the Quran says. It says, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'alo, come. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Number one, Allah na'bud illallah, that we worship none but one God. You say that, that we associate no partners with him, and that we worship not or create not from amongst ourselves lords and cherishes other than Allah. If then they turn back, then say, we submit our will to the will of God. And that would be my claim and request to James. That's what the Quran in fact says. I would argue with a person like him as knowledgeable and as articulate, as many people, more than many Imams, he should be on our side. And so I would invite him basically to what the Quran proclaims. We can have our disagreements, but I love him, I respect him, and I hope we have such meaningful engagements in the near future where Muslims and Christians can come together in love, in the human brotherhood, share each other's different points of views, and at the end of the day, go home and still respect each other. And I, I'll leave you with a Quranic verse which says, When truth hurls itself against that which is incorrect and false, that which is incorrect and false is bound to perish. Thank you very much. Just, 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 just one thing, one thing. I don't want to score any points here. I am disappointed with James on one thing tonight. He's been disappointed with some of I'm disappointed with his dress. He normally has a traditional bow tie. Okay, okay. And, so, and so what I did... Let me explain. I, 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 I brought bow ties, but the one purple bow tie, guys, I've been traveling for 10 days. <laughs> you stick your shirts in a, in a, a, a Dharma bag and fly across the ocean. This is the only shirt I come up with that wasn't going to make me look like I just walked off the street and the bow tie just didn't match. I'm oh. very sorry I did not wear it. Oh, well, well, that's fine. We, we've got a bow tie to match it. It's a bow tie outside and colors. <laughs> James. James is generous with I his particular stuff. I will wear this. I <laughs> Please will do wear that tomorrow. This is the book by Zulfikar al Hisham. Maybe we could discuss it in the next debate. And then we've got two books, Compliments of the IPCI by Tariq Ramadan and I have that. the biography of Ahmed Didat. You probably have that. I gave it to you the last time. Did I give it to you the last time? <laughs> Can't remember. Thank you very much. You've been generous. Thank you. We love you. God bless you, James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've uh, come to the conclusion of the debate, and uh, I wish to thank uh, Dr. White for the dignified manner in which he presented his arguments, and to Yusuf for the passionate way in which he argued. And to all of you, uh, thank you very much for being a great audience. May God Almighty take us all safely back home. Muslim Ummah. Alhamdulillah, one in five people in the world is a Muslim. But have we considered that four out of five people may die without Islam? Four out of five may never get the chance to read the glorious Holy Quran. Become a lifetime partner with the Islamic Propagation Center International Dawah Quran Project and help bring real solutions to the four out of five people searching for answers. By sponsoring a Holy Quran, you give the gift of life, real life, RPCR.
Dawa Quran project. It's time to get involved. Call IPCI now, IPCI, encircling the globe with the message of Islam.